Today's show is sure to be a masterclass in selling for orthodontic practices. We'll be discussing why value is more important than price, how the inclusion of emotional narrative can help you increase your starts, and a whole lot more. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Ortho Thrive. I'm your host, Richie Gerzon. Joining us today is Laura Capic Martin of Capic Martin Coaching. Laura has over 24 years in the dental industry. She is an orthodontic coach who is a certified dental assistant herself with 17 years spent as a treatment coordinator. She is also part of the TC faculty team with Align Technology. We're excited she's here. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Richie. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I uh, can't wait to hear your story. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about your career path? How did you get to where you are right now? So I, my mom was in the industry. So growing up from a very young age after school, I would be going to the office. She was a dental assistant, office manager. And I, at that time, would sit in the waiting room and observe how people were experiencing the hmm. dental office. And at that time, I knew as a kid, I was like, there must be a better way. I could see that people were waiting or anxious or nervous or scared or some people not even coming through the door and there must be a better way. And so I knew in high school, I was going to become a dental assistant. And you knew in first, high school, that was your decided. Yeah. Yeah. The, the guidance counselor said, you know, you have to have some variety of options. And I was like, nope, this is it. And <laughs> at that time, 25 now years ago, uh, you had to become a certified dental assistant, work for a year before you could apply for hygiene. Oh. So when I went to college, asked 60 people who's there to become a dental assistant, two of us, everybody else was there to do their work to then go into hygiene. Oh. But I knew that every superhero needed a sidekick. <laughs> every dentist needed somebody at their side to put systems through while they were being the super superwoman or superman. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was literally I, I you know I stood up on day 1 and said I want to become the best dental assistant in the world. Awesome. And straight out of school I got a job day after graduation downtown Toronto and I was at a very high end in a bank building uh and and I had a wonderful experience my first 4 years and a, that dentist did a lot of restorative work, like full rehab, rehabilitation. Josh went to um, Las Vegas Institute. And, and so I was seeing that work completed. And, and after four years, I thought, you know what, I've learned everything I have. It was a very small office, only five of us who worked there. And the hygienist there said, come work for another uh, doctor that I work for on Saturdays. And I kind of shimmied over there. Hmm. And he had a, a huge practice. And I was the fifth in the totem pole of seniority of the oh, dental wow. assistant. Okay. And he had, you know, this mega practice. And I, at that time was coming to the table and saying, I have ideas of how we can improve this system and this system and this system. Yes. <laughs> and at that time, of course, we weren't digital, we weren't paperless. And, you know, one day a week, I just had to pull charts for the hyg hygienist and him, you know, that was a, a full eight hour work day. Next day I was I was sterilizing and I, you know, would open up the sterilization door and say, sure. let me out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. And, and you would say, no, oh, that's great. But this isn't how we do things, Laura. Mm. That's not, how, this isn't how we do things. And so I kept saying, guys, I know I'm the rookie on the team, but if we want to win the championship game, give me a chance. <laughs> and he let me implement some systems. He certainly gave me a lot of raises. He loved my energy. But yeah. again, it was a seniority thing. And I thought mm -hmm. this is so ludicrous. And I adored him and I adored my coworkers. But again, I thought there must be a better way. And so I was questioning at that time, do I even leave the industry? Is it impossible? Really? Yes. yes. And yeah. I was running with the running room in Toronto. And one of the girls I was running with said, have you ever thought about getting into ortho? My sister's actually going on mat leave. She works for an orthodontist in the city four days a week who does listen, who wants his staff to take ownership of systems, who wants to just concentrate on his niche so that the staff can be problem solvers. And ah. so I went for the interview and it was only for a mat leave position for the dental assisting role. Uh, it was actually for the records coordinating role. So I, I went in that first day 
and I was taking photographs of after photographs and I was uploading them to the before photographs and what I saw that first day I had never seen I had no idea we could do orthodontically and that's to do with that's how I fell in love with beyond the smile that's when I fell in love with understanding what we can do with facial balance changes lip balance changes confidence and and even gum tissue health bone health things that I'd never seen things that I had seen at my being a dental assistant that I had seen us fix, you know, kind of patchworking over top of failing foundations. Or I'd seen at my second practice, a ton, we'd be doing two extractions, three extractions, partial plates, you know, sending for gum grafts, sending for root canal, sending, you know, correcting uh, a tooth that had chipped because the foundation was wrong. Yeah, not because they sense. bid into something wrong, not because, you know, they did, they have bad luck. It's because their bite was compromised. And mm-hmm. so what I saw Dr. Willie Dayan doing orthodontically, I, it blew my mind. And within the first week, as I kept seeing, I was, as I was uploading after pictures and I was looking at the before I stormed into his practice, his office, opened the door put my hand out and said, Oh my gosh, Dr. Dayan, what you're doing orthodontically, I never knew was possible. And, you know, I I just (laughs) said, I'm, I'm so happy to be working here. This is amazing. And I didn't find out until years later when we were on stage at the 2014 Invisalign summit that he said, he, I closed the door and he called his office manager and said, who is that? (laughs) (laughs) Seriously. She took over, she took over Ruth's mat leave and she, he's like, yeah, she's intense. Yeah. <laughs> she's intense. <laughs> That's how he put it up. That's, awesome. That's how he put it. And then, and then it became my career because three months later, the treatment coordinating position came available. And I knew of course, then it would be a full-time job because I was only mm. on mat leave. Yeah. And yeah. so I went to Willie and I said, I'm the perfect person for this job. He said, Laura, you're high energy. The last girl had high energy, but you know, we need somebody who could follow systems. Mm. I said, Dr. Dayan, I know what, if people, if I can have any say to help people have the results that you could achieve orthodontically, I will get you more people started than you've ever had before. That's what you said. That was your pitch, huh? Interesting. He said, what did he he say? He said more people started than I've ever had before. I said, guaranteed, give me three months. And that's where my give me three months started. So give smart. me three months. Because you're said, young at this point. You're, you're saying this is like a four or five years after high school. And Richie, guess what? Yeah. I had no idea what a treatment coordinator was. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Uh, talk about having entrepreneurial spirit. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So I, and right away, so I took over the job and what every single orthodontic practice does when the treatment coordinator gets into this position is we go on a weekend course, which I did. Mm -hmm. And then you learn how to do tasks, steps, do this, do this, do this, do this. But when I started doing the tasks, I realized it's unnecessary. It was back in the day of, one hour consult, then say yes to records, which are 300, then come back or take that day records. Then he takes, the doctor takes everything home. He studies, he creates treatment plans. You come back. Then we have another hour to discuss all these options with all these different prices. Mm. And you're spending all this time and all this money. And I said within my first three months, then again, Willie, who, why is this necessary? He goes, Laura, that's how it's done. I said, I don't need it. I don't need all this. You might need this to take the records. And I respect that. If you, what do you need on the plate to make an informed decision in regards to what's the best recommendation for this patient to get them to the results that you could achieve? Yes. Okay. So I said, Willie, I could sell it in one, one appointment. He goes in one appointment. I go, let's try. Really? You said this. Yes. Three months. Okay. Okay. We had the most starts we've ever had month after month. Willie was flabbergasted when I got a same day start and the family paid in full and booked the next three kids into treatment. And booked the next three kids into treatment. Yes. Interesting. 
so how long had you been working there when you achieved that milestone? We, it, it, within the three months, I had already hit my record. Yeah. Um, we got the most starts. And then immediately after that, we started implementing, reducing our three-step to two and or one. Wow. And that depended throughout my career, 17 years with Dr. Willa Dayan, that depended on the personality profile and how we customized the experience for the individual based on what their needs and wants are. So if I had an analytical patient coming in, which I had known before they came into the consultation, I knew that they love information. They're the only ones that I then offered a two-stage consult because I said, that's what we're all about. Mm-hmm. We're all about information. We're all about studying because that relates to them and makes sense to them to make an, a decision. So, so you were taking into account personality profile back then. Did you really know what yes. you were doing? Like, how did you figure that out? I've always, I've grown up with a family. My mom was in dental, as uh, dental assisting. My mom was in dentistry. My dad yeah. was in sales and my whole, oh. my grandfather's an entrepreneur. My grandfather's in sales. So my grandfather's been teaching me about storytelling from a very young age. From a very young age, I was on, you know, in the speaking contests and wanted in really? elementary school. Okay. Yes. And that was all due to storytelling. And mm. so- through that, I knew how it's just such an emotional ride in, in regards to motivating people, communicating with people, right? I mean, no matter what job and where we are social wise and where we are in the world and no matter what language, I mean, it's all to do with communication. And even with that communication, I knew that, you know, that I, that I, that I just wanted to help people understand. And that, that was kind of Dr. Dan's slogan was helping people want what it is we know they need. Yeah. Wow. All right. So so, you took these sales skills and orthodontic knowledge, no dental knowledge, and just applied it to the orthodontic field. Okay. Yeah. So if anyone knows who Dr. Willie Dayan is, he he we've called him in in Canada at least a line is he's the he's the grandfather of Invisalign. So he his niche within the specialty of orthodontics was fixing the foundation for better restorations. So he he would specialize in helping adult patients who had suffered the consequences of not fixing their bite and alignment. Hmm. And then had worked collectively with all the restorative dentists in our area so that he would do the pre foundational setup and then they would do beautiful, long lasting restorations. Oh, wow. So as you can imagine, when I started with Willie on the first week, We were already utilizing back in 2003 Invisalign because he knew the majority of his patients didn't want to wear traditional braces. So we were offering lingual braces, which is very tedious for us, for them to wear length of time, cost, speech. There's a lot involved with it. And so when Invisalign came out, he's like, I got to figure out how to utilize, how to manipulate this plastic. I got to, I got to, I got, that was his job which he did so successfully that he started touring the world. And that's how well, I could tell you that's how our systems became so efficient because he was hardly at the office. Hmm. Oh, the it, it, time, it was by necessity. You had to be super efficient because he wasn't in the office. Yes. Oh, wow. And then, <laughs> and then, and then from my standpoint, I had to sell a product that nobody knew of. Yeah. Back then, Invisalign wasn't a household back, name, right? <clears throat> right. So as Willie's traveling the world, telling doctors what we could do using Invisalign, not what Invisalign could do, what we could do using Invisalign and sharing what not to do in regards to all the things that he had to learn. They would say, but how is your trimmer coordinator doing this? How are you guys selling it? How are you doing this? He said, I don't know. Laura does it. I don't know. Laura does it. Are you serious? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay. So well, when, did, it, when did he force you to go on the road with them? Then? <laughs> that, was, that was 2014. So 2014 here in Toronto, we did our first lecture mm-hmm. and from there it just skyrocketed. I, I, I was at the ortho summit in 2014 and it was a packed house. I think they had to lock the door. There was no room left. Oh, so and from that day on it snowballed. I, I, I was traveling and lecturing two to four lectures a month for eight years pre, well, it's pre-pandemic. Every single month I was booked out six months in advance. What? For eight years. 
the whole wow. until pre-pandemic. So even pre-pandemic, I had about 60 lectures set up, but then of course that canceled. So at that time, you can imagine I'm sharing the experience that I have not only brought in from my communication style, my motivation style, my storytelling style, changing the way at which we consulted patients, understanding that the more we could do prior to them coming in, just the personality profiling. Willie and I had a, a way that we communicated the problems so that yes. people understood what, why, what was the value of doing treatment, what we wanted to fix for them. And then on top of it, my husband's an executive chef. We owned and co-owned two restaurants here in Toronto. So simultaneously, as Kurt's opening up the restaurants, I've always been so hospitable, so much different. That's something I teach is so yes. much more than customer service. So by as he was paralleling back in you know 2000, uh, the restaurant, we were incorporating all those things into the into our office. Yeah, all the hospitality skills and this really those soft skills. I mean, that <laughs> that is going right down the drain everywhere across the world right now, or at least right. where I go. <laughs> that's so, right. that's very, very needed. I know. And now we're still on our <laughs> own. So yeah, from, from there, so the, with the pandemic hitting, hmm. uh, I, of course, everything stopped. And so it gave me the opportunity to do what I finally wanted to do was to really mentor and change, change, help a lot of the treatment coordinators, because ah. as I said at the beginning, there isn't any schooling for treatment coordinators. So there's no yeah. schooling. I didn't know that. I, I just assumed there was. Nope. You can become hmm. a hygienist. As I said, you could have become a certified dental assistant, hmm. but then to be a treatment coordinator, what happens is most of us as as I too am a certified dental assistant, we come then into the role, not knowing that it's a sales role. So the advantage I had was my sales background. And then I also had the hospitality background and I had the, the knowledge and the education portion that I learned from Willie because he's a teacher himself. And because of the opportunity, we were really on stage as our doors were open for people to come and learn from what we were doing. Mm -hmm. But so usually treatment coordinators come from the dental assistant, like I said, and, but we're so nice. We don't like to push. I don't want you to push either, but there's a whole different mindset that you have to have when you want to help prevent problems and help them not, you know, help them achieve the results we know they can have. Yeah. I think I, I definitely agree that they don't realize they're going into a sales role or at the very least I've experienced a lot of resistance. In, in that sort of training or implementing those systems. So I think it's very important right. because I can bring the leads to the door, but it, if it stops right there at the coordinator, if they're not going to use any of those sales skills, you're going to leave a lot of you know, money on the table, basically, because you're going to lose a lot of appointments and starts. So it's interesting. So it really comes down, Richie, to how to communicate. So I call it consult communication is yeah. how to communicate, how to get them to want what it is we know they need. And that comes with confidence and understanding what, what as well we're selling. Do you find a lot of coordinators don't know what they're selling as well as they should? Is that something you see? Well, we're tasked to do so much within the allotted time hmm. that we're so consumed with what well, the checklist that, that we're missing all the important stuff to help people. Oh, like the devil's in the details sort of so, <laughs> okay, yeah. interesting okay and so again i think majority of people they think they're selling an appliance rather than the results ah the features versus benefits right ah yes so tell us a little bit more about that what what would be the incorrect way if you're selling just the appliance versus the benefits of it well, again, if you're a lot of times, if you're coming in right off the bat, I call it, you know, the order of operation is, is often failing you from the start. Mm. We ask all these great questions on the initial phone call or even when they come in just for conversation, but we're not utilizing that information to help fit the solution into their life. Then right off the bat, we ask them 
do you want Invisalign or do you want braces? Oh, that's interesting. Good point. How do they know? Right. Hmm. Okay. I don't have people coming in to say, we don't say, do you want an expander or do you want a headgear? Do you want jaw surgery or do you want an extraction? <laughs> sure. We, we don't say that because we know that we have to find out what your problems are, what your story is. Mm-hmm. And then we have a ton of solutions, which is RPE, MA, align orthodontics. Braces, tags, headgears, elastics. We got all this stuff. That's our that's our toolbox. Yes, absolutely. But based on knowing your story and knowing your problems, there are solutions that are better, a faster result, a better, the best recommendation to get you to the results. That's what I'm selling, the results. So Richie, I could tell you that I could get yeses without ever talking about fee. And without, without telling you what you have to wear. Without what? Okay. That is interesting. This sounds like a long meeting. Is that, I don't, is that the, what happens? You have to go into all this detail. How long does this take? No, that's the, that's the flip side, Richie, is that you don't have to go into so much detail. That's where I'm saying we're so, we're so, used to or programmed from Mm -hmm. the way that we think the consult needs to go that we're bombarded and feel like we have no time oh so we're doing a mental checklist in the meeting and we have to get through it no matter what Uh, i see even you'll find that a lot of treatment coordinators as the doctor comes in they're going thank goodness the doctor's here i can now get this tasks done now i can get the insurance paper done now i can get the consent form done now i can start with the payment plan now i can start with their folder Without oh. them being in the moment of saying, I'm the one that this family has just built trust with, with. And I have to remind the doctor what I just learned from them and make sure that the doctor doesn't screw up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, of course you hand it off. That makes a lot of sense. So really they, right. they downplay the whole sales part of it and they're focusing on all the checklist of stuff that I have to do. Hmm. It's It's unfortunate that we're, we're into a checklist mode. Do you think it's gotten better or worse since the pandemic? Well, what I loved about the pandemic, what I loved about where I thought we could go Mm -hmm. with the circumstances of the pandemic and our virtual platforms was for almost a decade and a half, I have been doing not Zoom, not virtual, but coffee shop consults. Yes. Meaning that I had new from just my inner acknowledgement of from my mom, when I went to go visit my mom, that people were nervous. I knew that if you look at how many people in the world are walking around with a mouthful of problems, a lot. Yeah. Who would benefit from ortho? Anyone with teeth. How many people have teeth? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, that's yeah. the point. All the people that I met with for 17 years came in and looked at my eyes and said, why didn't anyone tell me this? Are you telling me that if I had a gentleman come in who, who was seeing a, a periodontist a, a, and he was seeing a periodontist because he needed his second implant on a front tooth. So he had chipped the tooth, then needed a crown and a root canal. Years later, that failed. So then he needed a bone graft and an implant, and that failed. Now we're seeing another periodontist who's saying, I think you should go see Dr. Willie Dan and fix the foundation so that when I do this restoration, it'll last longer. Oh, really? That must have been interesting information to hear after all that pain they went through. (laughs) Right. So this is what I'm saying. We need to better communicate and educate the public on what the problems are with keeping the teeth bite gum tissue bones the way they are. Okay. That's what we need to focus on more than explaining this is Invisalign. They're clear trays. 
You take them out. These are attachment. This is braces. We go, the braces are glued on every tooth. And then, so treatment coordinators are tending to go over appliances. Yeah, which really no one cares about. Nobody cares. (laughs) For the most part, I see. I'll tell you what you got to do when you say yes to the results. And then I'll tell you, that's why I loved and spoke for, still do, I'm faculty at Align, because I have always been about creating the best experience possible. Mm. And I have seen everyone in my career wearing braces, lingual, surgery, extractions, RPEs, MA, TADS, elastics, you name it, I've seen it, we've offered it, we've done it, because it gets you to the results. What do you think is the easiest experience for people? Align orthodontics. Yeah, so if I'm, I'm telling anyone, listen, we have perfected these cases using align orthodontics. Come to us in four, six, eight, ten appointments. We can get you done. We did four, six, eight appointments on a really? consistent basis because our team created systems and realized from a consumer's perspective, what needs to be done at home versus the office, what we need to do for their success versus what we need to do for ourselves in their mouth. And you probably were doing this long before it was accepted as possible for six, eight appointments, right? Before, before, uh, before any system. Yes. Cause it sounds, it sounds like only now it's mainstream recognizing you can get so much done in so few appointments. I mean, dental monitoring is kind of proving that, isn't it? Cause it's showing you the data. Like, no, they don't need to come in. They can just stay. Correct. <laughs> you don't need right. to have these unnecessary but we, appointments. We, we, but this was part of the value, Richie, is that we have instructor extraordinaires, hmm. right? Like if, if you're sending your child to what sport or hobby do you think your child will go to? Yeah. What me? What do you think? Name something. Oh, soccer. Um, soccer. Yeah. So obviously you think you're going to take your son, right? Yeah. Your son to soccer. Then you know that that coach is going to coach him, teach him how to play. And if you want your son to become a professional soccer player, then you have confidence that coach is going to coach them and they're going to practice and they're going to get a relationship and they're going to know how to speak to that, your child differently than other children, because the approach has to be different depending on how they learn or how they, they take information or how they communicate. Yeah. Or depending on the position they want to play. So we too at the practice took all this into play. Even when I was, if I'm, if I'm meeting you, part of the value is that I'm putting, I'm realizing the skill sets of all my teammates and what their advantages are. And I'm customizing who I'm putting people with. So I know that their experience will be maximized. And if their experience is maximized, they'll refer family and friends which takes away from my job to sell more. Oh, so you're saying someone, is it the doctor and other coordinators deciding what coordinators are matching up with what potential patients based on their personality, just to make it more likely they're going to make the sale happen? Yes. That's interesting because you have to be able to recognize it very quickly to make the decision. You just met them, right? Yes. That'd be a very helpful skill to have in the office. Interesting. So, so yeah, there's a, there, yeah. So go, yeah. So that's a, it's a furthermore to your question, uh, benefits of (laughs) selling the results. Um, I, I just think, I think it's the, the mind frame, like even the way that we communicated as an industry in regards to the problems that people have in their mouth, I think we have to improve the way, you know, even if you look at how dentistry or, you know, how we, you know, if you ask how many adults floss or don't floss, um, they really don't understand the benefit. Because again, just for an example, may I ask you? Yeah. Right? About right, when you when you go to get a cleaning done with your hygienist, 
and you have the periodontal probing done. Yeah. Do you know what that is? <laughs> no, <laughs> I personally so don't. You know what? So this was a question I asked every single adult that came yeah. in, kids. How, I said, when you're laying in the chair and the hygienist is going three, two, four, five. Hmm. Do you ever hear them say that? Yeah. Three, they're measuring. They're measuring to see how firm the gum tissue and bone is holding the tooth in play. Oh, that's interesting. Didn't know that. Right. So isn't it interesting that we're, they're so jam packed in this time to clean your teeth, do periodontal probing, take the bite wings, chart this, polish, do the oral hygiene instructions, floss your teeth, that they're missing the most important job of all. Explaining to you the problem of a number greater than three. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Absolutely. It would mean a lot to you for sure. So just that, that soft deposits on your teeth in the teeth in the morning. Black. We don't brush it off because the teeth are overlapped. Teeth are crowded. Yeah. Slips underneath the gum tissue. Gum tissue becomes puffy. Within 48 hours, that becomes tartar, calculus, can't, can't, can't get to it. The hygienist has to clean it off. Yeah. Leave it too long. Now your crown to root ratio is compromised. Ah, yes. If your crown to root ratio is compromised or you have a deep pocket, which is the health of the tooth in holding in play for you to keep your teeth a lifetime. Mm. It's a big problem. Oh, absolutely. It's huge. It, and I saw at my second practice, extraction after extraction of people moving to Canada didn't have the benefit of good oral hygiene or dentistry. And now we're removing teeth. Oh, wow. And if you remove a teeth and ah, no one sees it, it's back there. Just leave it. It's fine. Now the teeth collapse. Now your bite collapse. Now you have jaw joint pain, clicking, popping pain, headaches, ear pain, neck pain, shoulder pain. Shoulder pain, neck yes. pain. That's well, interesting. Yes. Yeah. yes. So it is a big problem. So if we start communicating the problems in people's mouth and start realizing that that's where we have to stop and take the time to educate, communicate and motivate. Mm. That's educate communicate body. and motivate yes that's what we need to be teaching that's where i i'm training treatment coordinators to become specialists because we work at a specialty practice let me do that role and let the docs do their job of moving teeth and helping bites and doing clin tricks mm. So what do you think some of the biggest problems you often see at practices that you work with? Uh, it, it definitely ranges. So that's why right off the bat, the first thing I do is I have an audio assessment of people's consultations so I can get an idea of where their strengths, skill sets are, so I can identify where the performance gap lies. And so you're listening, you're listening to recordings so you can really see what's Correct. going on? Yes. yes. I wonder how many doctors have done that. That's so important. <laughs> I've definitely listened to so some recordings. It, Are you really surprised at what you're hearing? <laughs> right. So in fact, then what I do, Richard, is I teach them how to do their own assessments of themselves and their doctors, because that's what Willie and I did for every single year. We just improved our, the way that we worked. It's mm. the same. If you're sending your son to soccer or some kids, you know, want to be these professional football players or hockey players. You send these kids five days a week, plus skating lessons on top, to hope that they become a professional. <laughs> Yet we work at an orthodontic practice. Yes. And none of us practice. Ah, that's funny. <laughs> that's a good way to remember that. And we don't learn from our mistakes. So could you imagine if you're playing against an opponent in a sports team and number one, like for football, Super Bowl, could you imagine if they just had one play? Do it again. But they won't hope to think about it. Let's do it again. They won't hope to think about it. Let's try it again. Mm. 
They have the same approach, the same speech, the autopilot, autopilot kicks in. So if you're a doctor and, you know, you want to close more leads, you know, you're not getting enough starts from who's coming through the door. This is, you really need to do this analysis, this assessment at minimum, because you don't even know what the problem is, right? You're probably just wondering what's wrong. Right. And again, I, I'm treatment coordinators are so passionate. They Mm. love what they do. They love to help people, but we're, they're drowning with tasks. So So are do you generally, do you ever say that the doctor needs to hire more people or just gain more efficiency? What do you, how do you solve this drowning for tasks issue? If I could, so I've created a, a, a mentorship program that does last one year. Yes. It's in three months modules. So when I do the assessment, I'll identify where the problems are. Mm-hmm. And then I have my solutions and my system, my method at which I'll teach them. Gotcha. I teach first education. Some don't under, some dental assistants or some people are hired outside. Some people are hired as sales for this role. Hmm don't know the dental background and you're working at a dental specialist office. So I hope you can help people understand what we need to help them understand. That's pretty critical. So yeah. I thought somehow just about the molar class, just about bites, occlusion, mm-hmm. class one, class two, class two, uh, div two, class three, and all the consequences that come along and how to relate, how to have, how to communicate, communicate it efficiently to not only drive the value, but the urgency. Then I have my align orthodontics because a lot of times it's misconception in regards to Invisalign and what you can do with it. Yeah. And then the systems that come into play with it. And then what we do as a tumor coordinator to help the doctor in regards to, you know, all the work that they spend and all the time they, they spend on the clinic check. And then every system into play I have available. Then, then I teach sales, which is personality profiling, storytelling, hmm. communicating, interviewing, oh, and then the, my last module is hospitality. That I do ideally want the whole office to incorporate uh, that aspect. And there's something I would hope else so. I, yeah, <laughs> having yeah, one team member the, that's really good at it and the rest not is right, going to be super helpful. Right, <laughs> right. but but unfortunately, like unfortunately. What I just want to really help is that is the specialty treatment coordinators and the changes that are happening. So the reason why I was so busy prior to pandemic and TMs, the uh, territory managers of SAMs of a line were taking me into one-on-one practices was because after I left, they would grow 20, 30%. Wow. In their Invisalign sales. Some practices were going from zero to a hundred. Yeah. 100 cases just from understanding. Ah, because they thought that they were selling an alternative to braces rather than knowing what it's best suited for as a solution. Hmm. So you're talking about specialty a lot. If Should orthodontists always specialize, choose a niche? Should they just... Should their market be everyone? You know, how important is this choosing their patient persona and really focusing on that or choosing their, what differentiates them? What do you say to? So I think that I ask my whole career, I've asked everybody that. And, and the way that I can, can I give you an example of when I was asked to become a fitness trainer? or the, the exam trainer at, at the gym after my wedding now, 18 years ago. Okay. Yeah. This is where I started it from. I got a personal trainer to lose 20 pounds for my wedding. Loved my results. Then next thing you know, the owner said, can you come talk to me? And he's like, can you, can you do the fitness test from moving forward? And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm a dental assistant. I work at an orthodontic office. <laughs> what do you mean? All these guys are kinesiologists. I said, look at like, they're, they're crazy fit people. Why yeah. on earth would I get this test? He goes, because I could tell you could sell. I could tell that you would help people understand the value of hiring a personal trainer. 
Mm. So I had to sit down and, you know, with five different um, people that were, have been doing this for years. And as I listened to them, they all said the same speech over and over. Oh, really? The same, and they were pushing the cell rather than helping the person. Oh, that's so, yes. I'm, right. I'm a student of inbound marketing. So that's immediately yes. a red flag. <laughs> yeah. so what that's I right. did was my first person that I had to do a fitness test on was a crazy fit policeman. Okay. Good looking on the side. <laughs> and I was like, what on earth am I going to tell this guy? Yeah. But we all know who doesn't want to improve the way that they live their life. So you listen to their story. And then you create a solution. So what I had to do from that day forward was I had to go interview all 30 personal trainers to say, what's your niche? Because I got this guy who's a cop. I can't put him with anyone. He's got to get the results. So I have to know that you know how to make a fit guy even fitter. (laughs) Ah, of course. That makes sense. So, and if I have, so is your niche a female that just wants to lose weight or are you somebody that is specializing in somebody that has needs rehab? Are you specializing in somebody that's el- an elderly person? Are you specializing in somebody who wants to bulk up? What's your niche? So the moment I interviewed somebody to s- listen to their story, got a solution and I know the perfect person to put you with. I with conviction would say yes. And I, what did it happen? Got the highest sales. Awesome. And then they wanted me to work more, but I said, listen, this was my, I just came to help you guys. I, I'm really a yeah. supportive. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so that's what I taught them how to do. And then it's a sure shot. I can, I'm convinced that what I just sold you, the package, you're going to achieve the results because I know that person could achieve the results with you. Yes. Having that confidence and being authentic are super important in that sales conversation. So then some orthodontists are going to say, yeah, but I I could do anything. Absolutely. That would be their response. So what would you say to that? (laughs) I'm not niching myself. So listen, if Dr. Dayan niched himself in the fixing the foundation for better restorations, niched himself for improving facial balance to make people over 40 look younger. So smile exposure, facial, long, lower face heights for short, lower collapsed bites. If he niched himself for open bites, closing open bites using Invisalign, Hmm. could you imagine if we repeatedly had these patients coming in, all fixing foundation, all improving smile exposure, smile exposure, looking younger, closing open bites using Invisalign. Do you think us as a team is going to become efficient with our systems to get six, eight, 10 appointments? Yeah, of course. Do you think that I'm going to have umpteen photographs of all these patients? Because it's our, it's his magic. I called it his niche. So what I could do to market him and what I did was I called every dental office Two hours away, three hours away. Why are you calling me? You're three hours away. (laughs) Right, three hours, okay. Because what my doctor is doing using Invisalign in 18 months, that's more predictable than any treatment I've ever seen in my life. Without surgery, without elastics, without TADS, without dental monitoring, wearing Invisalign with selective posterior intrusion customized by my doctor and the experience with my staff. If you have any open bike cases, it's worth a drive to Toronto. Hmm. And that's all because you had that niche, huh? You really couldn't, you wouldn't have that story available without it. So don't you think that's what I did? And don't you think we got bombarded with open bike cases? Hmm. Yeah, makes sense. And what confidence am I going to have when they say, but Laura, the person down the street's $5,000 less? I'm not selling you an appliance. 
I'm selling you the results we achieve and the experience you have with us. So that leads right into price. You know, a lot of orthodontists, we don't want to be viewed as a commodity, obviously. And one lever you can pull is lowering price, but who wants to do that if they don't have to? So how do you fight that? That's what I teach treatment coordinators, the value of their doctor, the value of their team, and the value of the results they achieve. They have to 1,000% wholeheartedly. In fact, I would say to Willie, I don't think we're charging enough. Really? One implant in Canada, I don't know how it is there. One implant is $5,000 for one tooth. They want the payment in two or three payments. Hmm. We're dealing with 28 or 32 teeth. We're fixing bites. We're fixing facial balance, lip balance for an entire, whether it's one year, 18 months, two years, heaven forbid, out on the retainers. How much effort are we all doing? That's a lot. And we're charging this amount. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and if the doctor knows their value and they can articulate it, they're certainly going to help the marketing company because they would just know what to say. Right. So that, that is where the hospitality aspect comes into play and the importance of your team being specialists because they, I don't, they'll feel it and experience the value. Mm. Absolutely. I don't have to convince them by the end. They know it. In fact, they're always scared that I'm going to tell them more than I told them. <laughs> really? Yes. They go, Oh my gosh, that's it. I thought you were going to say more with all that customization. <laughs> um, if someone, <laughs> if people are getting these second, third opinions, why are they doing that? What do you think that's, why is that happening? How do we stop that from happening with our practice? Stop. I think it's the normal thing people do. I had my eavesdrops. I come over, my husband told me, Laura, I don't know anything about them. Hmm. I don't know anything about these people. I got referred. That's how I always referrals. Three people came. My husband said, get three referrals, get three prices. That's what people do. Okay. And who are you going to go with? The one that's the cheapest? Not generally. Or the one who you feel the most <laughs> or the one that you feel most comfortable with. Yeah. Absolutely. I see. So just accept it. It's normal behavior. Just make sure you're the one that's been chosen. You just give your you this is I I I've never been worried about anyone else's the competition. Because what Willie did, I felt like there was no comment. We continuously worked on ourselves and our systems on a daily basis. And I'll teach you how to do your own assessments, feedback, giving and receiving feedback from your staff. That we're always just improving ourselves to worry about what the competition's doing. Wow. Well, Laura, it's been a great, it's been a lot of information. <laughs> I think we're going to have to have you on again. <laughs> Because yeah. I can't, if I keep you on much longer, no one's going to watch all of it and they're going to miss yes. out all the sorry, good stuff. Sorry, sorry, yes. Yes. sorry, sorry, yes, I'm sorry. I mean, I think it's extremely valuable. I mean, I feel like I've learned a lot just listening to you. Because obviously I'm in a sales role myself day in and day out. And it's uh, universal information. Absolutely. Um, is there anything you want to mention before we wrap everything up? <laughs> Just that I, I thank you for this opportunity and I encourage anyone who wants to improve their efficiencies and the way that they help people that they, I feel, please contact me. So if they want to find out more information, what should they do? Where should they go? I'm catholicmartincoaching.com or I have, I'm on, I'm readily on uh, Instagram uh, at LC Mart or Catholic Martin Coaching as well. Perfect. Um, and Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Laura. It was great talking with you and I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Okay. Laura reminded me that we really need to understand why are we in the business that we're in? Why am I running a marketing company? 
Why are you an orthodontist in the practice? Who is your audience? What are you trying to help them achieve? Do you really honestly feel like you can get that done and that your solution is the solution that they absolutely need? You can see that's how she feels about aligners. If you are that passionate about what you're selling, you're gonna be more than you need to be successful. If you wanna be a guest on the show, you have an idea for an episode, go to orthothrive.com. You can reach me at richard at orthosalesengine.com. Keep grinding, keep thriving, and I'll see you next time.